Welcome, welcome, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, please be seated. It's interesting. Um, for those who are here for the first time, you'll be forgiven. Uh, the, first, the first gathering, uh, Pastor M was introduced for the first talk, and then guys were like, who's the second speaker? Who's the second? Huh? Pastor M. Who's the third speaker? <laughs> and it's like, what is going on? So let me explain. This is something that we have been learning. Uh, and we're in the journey. We're in the middle of a journey as a church, just understanding the culture that God wants us to have as we become a kingdom movement. And I'm going to be actually teaching on some of that stuff at Fearless. But part of what is happening is God is teaching us that as a family uh, that is also an army, that our culture has to shift. Uh, there's a kingdom way that God wants us to operate as a church that we didn't even know before. And one of those ways is understanding that God's word is not, how do I put it? Every time I taught God's word, I expected people to understand it and to apply it and to be transformed. So the word is information that brings transformation. That's kind of how I saw it. But what I'm learning now, and I've learned this through some of the friends who've been teaching us this, Bishop Doug, um, Hayward, uh, that you've heard me talk about, or Apostle Moses Makisa. I've come to understand that the word taught to the family is not information that leads to transformation. It's actually impartation. So in seminary, what I learned is about transformation, the word. This is the things I was taught. But I'm coming to learn that there's a very spiritual thing called impartation, which is the Holy Spirit coming on God's people when they hear the word from their shepherd. Uh, and that's why we have these concentrated times of teaching. Uh, it's, yes, the information is going to be good, but I sense that there's an impartation that God wants to bring on every one of us as a community as we come together and just listen to his word. I began to understand why Paul, the apostle Paul, would teach the whole night. Have you, have you read in the scripture? I mean, he teaches, and then when he, the day he's leaving, he'd even teach. The day he taught till midnight, a guy fell off the window. Even if you're taught till midnight, a few people might fall off. The guy fell off. Unfortunately, he was sitting on the window. He fell, he died. What did the guys do? They rushed down. Paul went, told the guy, you're interrupting. Get up. The guy, was re he rose from the dead, and Paul just said, go and give him something to eat. Let's continue. And the meeting continued till morning because Paul had an impartation to leave on those people. So I believe that this is what we're learning, and I'm sort of humbly seeking to just follow God. I must confess, I've been a reluctant. Some of these things I'm learning myself. And I think the first gathering, how many people were at the first gathering? Let me just see again. I think you're the guys who helped me begin. I think it's, uh, we learned it together, didn't we? Because that day, God's Spirit just showed up in such a peculiar way that I'd never seen all my years at Mavuno. And I thought, my goodness, I'm a believer. And so I really, tell your neighbor impartation. There's God, I mean, I was not surprised when somebody said that they were healed as the service was starting. Uh, that's impartation. Nobody even needed to pray for them to be healed. There's just something powerful when we come together under God's word as a community. Just, it's not a Sunday service, it's just a concentrated time of listening to God's word. So I really am excited about um, today. Today, the theme, as I thought about today, I really feel like this is about uh, the shepherd. We're learning about the shepherd. I really feel like that's what we're learning. Today, we're learning about being kingdom uh, builders. And I think that God calls every single one of us to the work of being builders. And we say building is not putting stones on other stones. It is building people. And to build people, you have to be a shepherd. And so I really sense that this is what God wants every single one of us to be uh, as a community. There's none of us who's not going to, to build this house. There are no excuses not to be a shepherd. Tell your neighbor, no excuses. Every single one of us. And like I said, some of us are young. Some of us are young. Let me just see any, okay, not you, Pastor Jade, but any, uh, anybody here who is under 20, just show, show of hands. Just raise it up real high. Come on, come on, come on. Just raise it up and wave it in the air. Wave it in the air. We're so proud. Praise God for all of you. I'm so excited. There's so many young people, in this, some of them even under 10, and I'm so excited because I believe that there's no, God's word is not for the adults of this church. In fact, in fact, they get it much faster because they have less, they're holding on to less. Some of us, God has blessed us so much over the years, we hold on to those blessings and they actually become the hindrance for the next move of God. And so I'm so excited that we're bringing our young people, our teenagers uh, into these spaces because I believe that some of these young guys, 
they are going to baffle us when we see how God is moving. God is going to work in accelerated fashion in those people. Let me just say again, people under 20, people under 20, in Jesus' name, we are proud of you. To God be the glory. Yeah, this church will be led by you. Uh, watch this space. Watch, mark those words. Mark those words. Pastor Jade, uh, don't worry. Uh, you're close. Your category was the next one I was going to mention. <laughs> so, 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 yeah, don't let anybody look down on you because you're young. Uh, if you're in high school, if you're in college, uh, this is your space. And my prayer is this, that group will actually grow in this gathering that many more of them will start to come because they're part of our church. And I believe that God's word is for them as well. And I think many times we dumb down the word of God for the young. Uh, we sort of think that this is too complex for them. It's not. I really think that this stuff we're teaching is just as relevant for you in high school as it is for somebody who is running a company in their 30s. And so I'm really excited today that you're here. Um, those of you who've been part of, so, so those of you who've been part of Mavuno for a while, You've noticed we've been talking a lot about discipleship groups. We used to talk a lot about life groups. That was sort of the, the, the language of the earlier time. And right now, one of the biggest shifts in our culture, I talked about the culture shift, is God moved us from life groups to discipleship groups. And what I'm going to do as I begin this session, because I want to talk about the job description of a shepherd. Basically, your job description. Tell, tell your neighbor, he's talking about you. So, 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 so I want to give you your job description as a shepherd uh, from God's word. Now, what I sense that God wants for every single one of us in this new season to lean in to owning this as our job description. This is what, this is what it means for us to build God's house in this season. And part of what you've, ta- you've, you've seen is a difference. When we talk about the, the difference between a life group and a discipleship group, it begins to show you some of what the operation will look like. I don't know if you have those differences uh, on the screen Uh, Is the screen working, Emmanuel, if you're able to project those or whoever is at the back? Because I'd love to just uh, sort of talk about them. Yeah, there you go. So so these are some of the basic differences uh, between a life group and a discipleship. For those of you who've been asking, what, like, like why are we insisting on, is it like just another name? Is it a rebrand? Is it, is it just a new way of talking? Like, is there a real difference? There actually is a very significant difference, and it is a difference that is going to be it's, it's actually the difference that's going to make this new season. It's a thing that's going to actually usher in the revival that I think God is bringing to, to our generation uh, and in this church. So, so let me just go through those. Uh, a life group and a discipleship group, the differences. The first is a life group was led by a facilitator. So a facilitator basically was a person who convened people, maybe in their house or in another house, and they led a spiritual conversation. And once the spiritual conversation was led, uh, the group had done its work and the facilitator had done their work. We even use the title a facilitator. The the reason it's a facilitator is because I'm just one of you. Uh, It's not that I'm special. I'm just one of you, and I I just happen to have the questions from the church that can lead the conversation. That's what a facilitator did. The difference is a discipleship group is led by a discipler. Another word for a discipler is a shepherd. And that person is a spiritual parent who is determined to see his or her people grow. So are you seeing the difference? One was like, I'm one with you. We just do things together. We're all hanging out. We're all peers. This other one has a very different connotation. It says, I am a shepherd. I am actually representing God in this group to help all of you grow. That's my role. So when you're a discipleship group leader, you have a lot more responsibility uh, uh, than what a life group leader would have had before. Uh, Life groups meet any day or time of the week because they were just scattered and they did. uh, They met whatever time was convenient for them. For discipleship groups, as much as possible, and unless when it's absolutely impossible, they meet on Wednesday evenings. And the reason they meet on Wednesday evenings is because we have family night. night. We have a time together when we uh, connect around God's word, uh, and then now they are able to break out. Uh, And this is a movement rhythm. It is something that brings the entire movement together. So there are people who are watching uh, family night from all across the whole movement, every compass. And the idea then is that they're able to go into their, their groups. Now, with time zones, it might mean that for some people, they, watch, they don't watch it live. They watch it rec- they recorded before they get into their life groups or their discipleship groups. But there's a, there's a, a way we do it differently. Uh, life groups discuss sermons. They would take the Sunday sermon and discuss it uh, where time allowed. But discipleship groups, they disca- discuss and apply instructions. I think you heard Pastor Angie use that word a lot, huh? Instructions. And the understanding here is that God's word is not given to us for information. 
that will hopefully lead to transformation, there's an impartation, which means that it's an instruction. Whenever you hear God's word taught, you listen to it and you say, that is God's word for me. And when you begin to do that, listen to God's word together. And then we say, God has said this to me. This is what I've heard God. God says different things to different people, even with the same word. And I'm able to apply that word uh, with my group. Uh, and here's a thought there. The thought is that God has a peculiar word for this church. God has a very particular word for this particular family. Uh, and that whenever that word is given, it actually blesses when the family applies it. That's a paradigm shift, even for me. Uh, that there's a thing that God has said for this church regularly. And that when people run with that word, they are transformed. Amen. Amen. There have been very peculiar words that God has given us, hasn't it? Yep. There are words that God has given us, like God gave us a word that this year, every single one of us is going to grow in love with Jesus. Like our faith is going to grow to the next level, more than we've ever experienced. That's a particular word for this church. Uh, it's a word that says, if you're part of this family, you run with that word. It's your instruction. And you say, God, I'm taking that as my word. I'm running with it. My heart might be cold right now, but I'm believing you've said that this is what's going to happen to us. And so you're leaning in as God's word. So that's, that's one of the reasons why we talk about instruction, that God says particular things to us. Uh, the focus in life groups is forming friends who support me through life. And that's a beautiful thing. But in discipleship groups, we go to a different level. We say the focus is forming a missional community. It's a family on mission. We're not just friends, we're a family. And we're not just here to, get to be a family, we're here to do God's. We're a family that happens to be an army. And we've talked about that from the book of 2 Timothy. Uh, there's there's, a, there's a, a family with a function. That's what we do. Uh, the focus in, in life groups is forming, uh, sorry, the, the focus uh, in life groups is no expectations on growth. And I don't mean that in a, in a negative way. It's like if people grow, that's a good thing. But there isn't this sense of what's happening. My people aren't growing. I mean, there's nobody asking that particular question in a life group. But in a discipleship group, every member is expected to grow. Every member is expected to grow. Now, when I'm, uh, if I'm a discipleship group leader and my discipleship group members are not attending 4.30 prayers, there's a problem for me uh, because that's my job. I want to make sure you're praying and you're connecting with what God is doing in this campus. And so as a discipleship group leader, I see it as my role to call you and ask you, I've not seen you for the last few days at 4.30 prayer. What's happening? Because I'm your shepherd. Does that make the difference? It's like there's a shepherd who's watching over me. I shall not want, anybody know that song? I shall not want, cause my soul's got a shepherd in the valley, and I shall not want. That should be the song of everybody in your discipleship group. I shall not want, cause I've got a shepherd. When I miss prayer, he wakes me up. Psst, wait, wait, wake up. That's a shepherd, right? Uh, when I talked about a mission of family, I forgot to mention one of the things about a mission of family is that the family has a particular calling. And so we, we say in our discipleship groups, we bring at least one person, we want, we, we want to bring at least one person to Jesus as a group every week. That's one of the things we're saying. And, and maybe we haven't yet begun to apply that, but this is actually one of the expectations. In, when, we're not just a family, we're a family on mission. And so we want to bring at least one person to Jesus every week, and we want to serve our community at least once a month together. Um, so we're, we're in the process of just bringing this change in the different campuses so that our discipleship groups become families on mission. Um, let me go on with, with the next change. Uh, groups are mostly closed in life groups. In other words, people have been together for years. Anybody joining would probably feel like they don't fit in. People have inside jokes. I mean, it's like we're, we're walking through life together, so we don't necessarily, I mean, we've got each other. We don't necessarily need others. With a discipleship group, the groups are actively open. <laughs> in fact, they're always looking to invite other people. Uh, it's that family that's an open family. It's like we want new members to join our family. We want this family to have new children. We want our family to grow. And so the group is always inviting neighbors, inviting workmates, inviting colleagues. It's just inviting people. We want our group to grow and, to be, and we want other people to become part of the family. And that's a major, major difference. Uh, in life groups, our groups stay together because of relationship. They stay together through relationships. Uh, maybe they exchange leadership regularly. Uh, when the previous leader needs a break, uh, they, 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 the relationships are the things that kept them together. But in a discipleship group, 
The group stayed together through relationship, yes, and mission. Mission is one of the things that also holds them together. Each group member is equipped to lead. By the way, that's one of the expectations. When I'm a discipleship group leader, I'm seeing everybody here as being equipped to lead their own group. So I want to pass on the ability for you. I'm, I'm not looking at you as people who are, you know, it's like a family. Think about a family. There's no father who's a good father who looks at their children and says, I hope when I die, all my children will be around me single and all dependent on me. That's a dysfunctional family, isn't it? Well, the joy of a real father and a real mother is that they're saying, we want our kids to have their own families. So that when we gather, we're a bigger family, isn't it? I mean, that's what a family, like when my dad now, comes, when I come with Pastor Carol and my brother comes with Rosalind, his wife, and my sister comes with her husband, Richard, and, and, and we show up. I mean, that's, the father looks happy. He's like, my, and then we show up with our kids. Oh my gosh, the guy is over the moon. He's like, can you even leave them here? <laughs> that's how families naturally are supposed to grow. And so as a discipleship group leader, I want to see my children having children. I want to see the people I'm looking after having other people that they're looking after as well. That's a, a healthy discipleship group. Uh, the next one is groups. Um, life groups are mostly disconnected to other groups. Uh, they, did, they had their rhythms, yes, but they sort of went about it like we're a group, we're it. But in discipleship group, our groups are interconnected. And how does that happen? As the numbers increase, groups multiply. So if we're in a group and Pastor Milton is in my group and he brings several of his friends and neighbors to our group, a time comes when we say to Pastor Milton, start your family. <laughs> this, place is beca this, this room is becoming too, too, too small for all of us. And he starts his family. And Pastor uh, Mutai uh, starts his family. But then what happens is the families are now interconnected. Because what has happened now? I've become a grandfather, <laughs> to use family language. And what happens is when we serve once a month, all our groups come back together to serve in the same place. Now, the beauty of that is when we multiply, we're not dividing. Because many times people fear dividing because it's like we're such friends. We want to be together. Yes, we're still going to be together, but now it's going to be a family gathering. Uh, once a month when we come, we serve together. The groups stay interconnected. Uh, alignment to the vision in life groups is through periodic training of leaders. So we train our leaders every so often. But in discipleship groups, the alignment happens through connection to the shepherd. And how does that happen? Every week at family night, every single person in Mavuno gets to hear from me as their leader. But then in addition, every day at the time of 4.30 prayer, every person in Mavuno gets to hear from their campus pastors and their leaders uh, in time of prayer. So there's a, a sense in which the life groups are not necessarily just hearing just in their own space. But there is a language that is causing alignment uh, and the groups are not drifting from the mission that God has given us. And then lastly... In the life group, new leaders are commissioned and promoted through availability and appointment. So whoever is available uh, is, hey, you look good. <laughs> you're, you're quite free right now since you finished your exams. Can you be our leader? Uh, it's like availability. Uh, but now we're saying in a discipleship group, leaders are commissioned and promoted through multiplication and fruitfulness. So as, I, as Pastor Milton begins to bring his own people to the group and the group is growing, he's already become a leader. Uh, he's already proved himself to be a leader, so he starts his group based on the fact that he has his people. And as his people grow and multiply, then he becomes a missional community leader, which is a group that goes out once a month to serve together. Uh, and as those groups multiply, he becomes a zonal shepherd, uh, because that's how the groups are growing. So it's, it's about fruitfulness. That's what make, makes you to be a leader. So I wanted to share that because I sh I've shared it in another gathering. You guys have heard this before, isn't it? But I thought it's good to just refresh that, because there's a big paradigm shift that is happening at Mavuno. There's a way of thinking that is shifting. And what we're saying is, we're beginning to learn, at Mavuno we've got the best, I really think that the discipleship programs God has given us are fantastic. They're amazing. Uh, the Mizizis and the Simamas, and the, they're, they're incredible programs. But programs don't disciple people. People disciple people. It's, it's, it's shepherds who grow people. It's not programs. That's one of the, the things that I think has really become a conviction for us in this season. And so every one of you is called to be a shepherd. Every one of you is called to help people grow. Every one of you is there to fulfill the Great Commission. There are no excuses. All of us build God's house. Tell your neighbor you are a shepherd. Yeah, whether you're leading a discipleship group or not right now, you, that is your role. That is your job description. God is calling you to be a good shepherd 
and to lead your people. Thank you so much for those who've opened the flaps. It really works well if once you guys finish that side, come to this side also. The little cross current really helps. It's going to, don't worry, it's going to cool off in just a bit. Um, so let me talk a bit about the job description of a shepherd. That's kind of what I want to talk about today. What's a job description? If that's your job, so what's the job description? Yeah, this is your, you're getting a job. God is giving you a job. God gave you a job 2,000 years ago, but maybe you just never understood the JD. Have you ever done a job without knowing what you're supposed to be doing there? It's frustrating, isn't it? Because you don't even understand, like, why am I here? <laughs> so this is sup supposed to be like your JD. This is the thing that helps you know as a Christian, as a fruitful Christian, as a person who's building God's house, as a person who's representing God wherever I am, these are the things I do. Now, my prayer is that we'll actually have disciple, and not my, it's already happening in some of our campuses, that we have discipleship groups among the children. And that young children are leading other young children in discipleship groups. And we're teaching our kids to be disciples. Come on, somebody. Yeah, and we're teaching our youth, our, our high school students, our college students, that they will be disciples as well. This thing is not about sitting down and listening to some adult uh, who just teaches you every day. It's about understanding you're a shepherd too. Uh, this is the way God's house works. It's like all of us are supposed to be shepherds. Now, the crazy thing is, when God's word talks about his followers, the animal that God uses to talk to his followers, it's very interesting, it's not lions. Tell your neighbor, you're not a lion. It's not bears or wolves. It's not none of those fancy animals. The word he uses is sheep. Sheep. And you can see it in the scripture. I'll give you a couple of scriptures. Psalm 95, verse 6 to 7. It says, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Tell your neighbor you're a sheep. I know it's a weird thing to call someone, it almost sounds insulting. Sheep. Why am I a sheep? Why aren't I a stallion? <laughs> Why aren't I like a... Huh? Why am I being called a sheep? Kondo. It even sounds worse in Swahili. Kondo. You're a sheep. Psalm 103. Uh, Psalm 100, 100 verse 3. It says, It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Yeah, I'm not making it up. The Bible calls you sheep. Yeah? It's, in fact, it's very interesting because John 10, 27, I didn't even give this one to them. John 10, 27 says, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. My sheep. Jesus says, anyone who's following, my sheep. That's what you are. Let me just ask you, why do you think sheep is an appropriate word for people following Jesus? Discuss it with your neighbor, by the way, just for two seconds. Why sheep and not lion? Why, why not, not horse? Not elephant, <laughs> not, you know, not eagle, not those nice animals. Why sheep? Like usually sheep sounds like somebody's just insulting you, like you sheep. Why sheep? Yeah. <laughs> Why are you a sheep? All right, let's hear some ideas. Why, why are you a sheep? Or oh, why is your neighbor a sheep? Anybody have an idea? Yep. The? Sheep don't insist on their own way. Very interesting. Very interesting. Any other thoughts about why you're a sheep? Oh, yes, sir. They. Oh, my gosh. Like, what's your name, sir? Seth. Like, I was going to give other people an opportunity, but you've said all the best answers. <laughs> so I told you guys, just be careful. This, the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Thank you, Seth. I really honor you. That's a great answer. That's actually the answer in my notes. I was going to wait for them to give me all the funny answers, and then I'd have told them it's because they follow. My gosh, I love it. I love Seth. So, so guys, this is why we are sheep. Sheep succeed when they follow. Sheep succeed when they follow. When a sheep follows, it is very successful. When a sheep doesn't follow, it is not successful. And it's very interesting because in Psalm 23, David, who wrote that psalm, was a shepherd himself. But he called his relationship with God, between him and God. He, actually, the best metaphor he had was, God is my shepherd, which means I'm his sheep. 
He understood how sheep operate. God is my shepherd. And he wrote Psalm 23, the, the shepherd psalm. And I think it's actually a very powerful psalm. Uh, can you just put it up, Psalm 23? And let's just read it together. Psalm 23, I want us to just read it together. Um, can we all read it together? The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Come on, guys, we're ahead of you. Okay, they're not there. Okay, we can just go. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. We're so far ahead of them. <sighs> he guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. All right, let's go to the next one. You guys, are, at least you have the next one. Let's go. Uh, come on, go, go. Uh, 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 okay, let me have the men read this one. Guys in the house, are you ready? Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I love it when men read. Isn't it powerful? I love it. All right, let's go to the next one. Let's have the ladies read. You prepare a table. <laughs> Presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup. Wow. Come on, let's appreciate the ladies in the house. That's so awesome. Sounds so good. And let's read the last one together. Surely, surely, your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. How long? Forever. Forever. That's a powerful, powerful, powerful psalm. I mean, David was a creative, but this, is, this must be one of his classics. You know, when you think about the psalms, this is one that many people here have memorized. I could even tell that even when the guys were slow, you are ahead. It's like we know it off head. Many times it's a psalm that has comforted people. Uh, this one has comforted people for thousands of years. Uh, it's a psalm that we've read in funerals. Have, you had, have anybody ever heard this preached in a funeral? Yeah. When people are, are troubled, when people are struggling, when people are suffering, it's just such a great word of comfort. It's such an anointed word of comfort for God's people. You know, I've always loved this psalm, but recently as I read it, like it just struck me in such a different way from any way I'd ever seen it before. Because I began to understand something, that this psalm is actually God's job description. It's talking about the things that God does for the people he leads. This, this is God to you. When you talk about his job description, the Lord is your shepherd. And then he tells you, what does a shepherd do? And because he does it, first of all, you shall not want. And number two, surely, goodness and love follow you all the days of your life. When he does those things, that you are comforted, you're looked after, you're protected, all those things. But one of the things I also began to realize about God is that one of the most loving things he's ever done for us is that he puts us under the care of human shepherds. He puts us under the care of human shepherds. Every single one of us was born into a family. He puts you under the care of others to look after you. He, he designed family. He designed people to shepherd us. And because God calls us to be shepherd, it's interesting because in God's house is the one place where the sheep are also expected to be shepherds. Isn't that interesting? You're not just a sheep, but you're a shepherd. That's David. David is a shepherd, but he understands I'm also a sheep. It's like someone's looking after me as I look after others. That's how God, God's house works. The shepherd also learns to be a sheep. And so Psalm 23, apart from showing us how awesome God is, how amazing he is and his job description for us, I believe it's also God modeling to us our job description as shepherds. He's like, as I do these things for you, now do them to the ones you're discipling. Do them to others. That's God teaching us our job description. And so today, that's why I want to call this the job description of a shepherd. The job description of a shepherd. Psalm 23 verse 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. God's description, God's desire is that those you shepherd will lack nothing. God's desire is anybody in your group, if you're a child in Mavuno Kids and you're running a small group, they will lack nothing. If you are a, a teen in Mavuno Kid, uh, Mavuno uh, Young and Fearless and you're leading a small group there, they will lack nothing. If you are an adult leading one of our adult discipleship groups, your people will lack nothing. They will not want. 
They will not want, they will lack nothing because you're looking after them. So I want you to take notes. Today you need to take notes because you are all called to be shepherds. Every single one of you is going to find that this is your job description as one of the people, the shepherds who builds God's house. Six things a shepherd does for his or her sheep to help them to lack nothing. Six things. Number one, a shepherd feeds. A shepherd feeds. Psalm 23 verse 2, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. Lying down in green pastures, what's that about? If you know anything about sheep, the picture you get here is sheep that are well fed and relaxed. There's no sheep that lies down when it's hungry. It lies down Kwanzaa when it's in a green pasture and it's lying down. That means it is well fed. And if you know anything about school, any of you who did biology, you know something about sheep and you know that sheep are ruminants. Okay, anybody remember this? You know some people burn their books after high school. It's like I never want to think about that. What's a ruminant? A ruminant? It chews card. It regurgitates and chews card. Another thing about a ruminant? It has four stomachs. Hey, come on, Pastor Kilonzi. I can see you are... These are the guys who they maximize their school fees. Uh-huh. Oh, come on. He even knows the names of the four stomachs. The four stomachs are rumen, reticulum, omasum, abomasum. Oh, my gosh. Anybody remember? Like some of you, you're remembering this with sweat. Cold sweats. Nightmares of exams. Things that you hoped would never come back to your recollection. Coming to church to hear these things is traumatizing for you. It has four stomachs, absolutely. Uh, a rumen is all, I mean, a ruminant is also a herbivore, which means it, it eats grass and greens. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so these are, my goodness, some of you did well in biology, I can clearly tell. Ruminants, they have four stomachs, they eat grass, they chew card. They first swallow their food. They swallow their food. And the reason they swallow their food quickly is because there could be prey around. And they don't have that much time. So they need to eat as much as they can, as quickly as they can. The food goes down into the first two stomachs, uh, which we're told is the rumen and the reticulum. And in that place, what happens is they, they start being digested. Uh, they, because they eat this hard stuff, uh, they need it to be softened. And so there's some enzyme, the, the stuff, the grass has something called cellulase, which is a very protective hard substance. And so they have an enzyme called cellulose. The enzyme is called? Cellulase. I give you the answer. Cellulase. And you guys remember this stuff? Am I? Is it? <laughs> you are not there that day when they taught this. Or <laughs> it feels like yesterday for some of you. So, so, so the cellulase softens the stuff. And then once they're well fed and they have time, they can lie down somewhere content and then it comes back up. Yuck, I know. And then they chew it again. That's why you'll see a sheep just eating. Just, just eating. And they're not eating, but they're just chewing because the stuff is coming back. And this time they grind it and grind it and grind it. The saliva has more cellulase. It breaks it down even farther. And then it goes down. Night even passes the, the, the rumen and reticulum, it goes to the omasum and abomasum, I love this guy. Uh, it, it goes into the third and fourth stomach, and then there it gets now really digested, and a lot of it gets absorbed before the rest of it just comes out used up. Okay, I know you're not expecting a biology lesson. Uh, I've always wondered where I'll use this knowledge. <laughs> Man, I mean, I, I had a whole degree in biochemistry, I have to teach something, you know. So, so <laughs> why is this relevant to you as a shepherd? Why is this relevant to you as a shepherd? Listen, every believer, they swallow the word when they listen to God's word on Sunday. They swallow it, but they don't have time. That two hours is hardly enough. They just hear it and it's new ideas and they're writing it down and it's coming down. But it's not going to do them much good because it's, it's hard. It's not digested. And so they need to have a space to digest it. And so when they come to family night, it's a place where now it's being regurgitated a bit. And it's being brought back up. Remember, guys, this is what we learned. This is what it meant. Here are some stories to make it relevant. And guys are like, ah. Then they come to you as the shepherd in the discipleship group meeting. And that's a place you begin to ask, guys, what have you heard God say? And guess what's happening? They're chewing it and they're swallowing it. And now it's useful to them. It's going straight to the place where it can help them. 
they're now, help, it's, they're now lying down in green pastures. This is what it means. When you're doing your job well, your sheep are content. The people around you are listening to God's word. They're, they're understanding what it is. They're, 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 they're content. They're not wandering around from church to church, from YouTube preacher to YouTube preacher, looking for scraps because they're starving, even though they were in church on Sunday. So this is what your job is as a shepherd. And when you feed your people well, then they are settled. They are serving. They are involved because they are feeling that they do not want. Paul, uh, uh, the book of John, uh, chapter 21, uh, uh, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, of course, Lord, you know I do. And Peter is like, Jesus is like, okay, feed my sheep. Yeah, that's how you show me you love me. You're telling me you love me. Jesus, I love you. I love you. <laughs> feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. That's how you show. And he shows it three times, isn't it? Yep. It's rare in the Bible there's emphasis of, of that level. It's like, feed my sheep. Until Peter almost was crying. Like, what is he saying? Is he saying I don't know? No, no, no. Peter, feed my sheep. I believe that's God's word to every one of us. That we will feed God's sheep. We will feed God's sheep. That's our first role as a shepherd. And so understand that God wants you to be a feeder of the sheep. So when you come to church and you're listening to the word, you need to be absorbing it, understanding it, reflecting on it yourself, because your job is to help other people to receive that word as well. Uh, when you're in a discipleship group, it's your role to make sure that people are actually applying this word. As they go around sharing, this is what I'm going to do, this is what I'm going to do. Your question needs to be, by the way, the last time we had this word, you said the same thing. Have you done it? Because it's your, it's your job to make sure they're actually applying what they're saying. They're not just saying the thing to say it. You're feeding them. You're making sure that the word is actually nourishing them. You know, many, Christian, many times as Christians, we've been taught to be knowledge Christians. We've been taught to want, and I've seen this, that Christians believe the more knowledge I have, the better a believer I am. But you know what? The most knowledgeable people in Jesus' day they were called Pharisees. And they had a disease called spiritual indigestion. Because they ate the word without applying it. They were not using it. And so basically what the word does, knowledge puffs up. That's what Paul tells us. So your job as a person, is to, as a shepherd, is to say, uh-uh, that, yeah, no puffing in my group. <laughs> We've had this word. Right now we're talking about what? What's, what's, what's the word God is giving us at Mavuno Church right now? No offense. And your job as a shepherd is to make sure, is there offense? Is offense hurting people in my group? Are people just having a surface conversation? Are we really talking about offense in a way that's helping us? And making sure that I understand where people are offended in my group so I can pray for them. I can ensure that that word is actually bringing... Of course, that means even I'm trying to apply it in my life. But it's my job to make sure that people in my group... Because this is God's word for us in this season. And many times I believe that God gives us his word for quick application. Your, your, we've always said, your revelation is only as good as your last application. Yeah, if you want to keep hearing God, then you have to be an applier. Because if you hear God and you write it and you put it in your backpack and wait for the day you'll apply it, God will stop speaking. And so you want to make sure your people are growing, are hearing God's word. So the first role, feed God's sheep. We feed God's sheep. Role number two of a good shepherd. A good shepherd refreshes the sheep. Refreshes the sheep. Psalm chapter 23, verse 2 to 3. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. The picture here is of calmness, of restfulness, of assurance. As a shepherd, one of your key roles is to help the sheep God assigns to you to feel at home in the church, to feel at home in the movement, to feel at home in the discipleship group, to feel loved and wanted and refreshed. How do you do this? By creating an environment of love and acceptance where people know that they are home. This is their home. They are loved for who they are, not just what they have or what they don't have. You look out for members who are shy and quiet and you nudge them to share because there are some of us who always have something to say when we're asked to share and we hog the group and you quickly forget as a shepherd there are people who haven't talked for the last three meetings. And it's your job to say, thank you, Pastor M. I love that reflection. Let me just pause right now. I haven't heard Pastor Milton say something. Uh, what are you thinking, Pastor Milton? You're so quiet. That's a shepherd is making sure everybody is coming along. Everybody knows that their word is important in this group. Everybody feels wanted and accepted. That's your job. You know, there are many people, the devil cuts off. You know, that's what he does, huh? He cuts off sheep and he attacks. And we'll talk about that in a second. But for me as a shepherd, I want to make sure people are connected. 
people are growing. People who are in church and they're listening to the word and they're processing it. I want them to feel that they are loved. My job as a, dis- a, dis- a discipleship group leader is to make sure we visit each other. We don't just meet for a functional meeting and then we go home. But I want to say, hey, it's pa- let's go visit Pastor Ndachi's uh, relatives. Uh, and, and, and let's just go to your, your parents' place and let's, let's come and bless them. Or let's come to Pastor Milton's home and let's just visit them. And what am I doing? I'm building family. I'm building team. I'm building family. I'm building a sense of people being, feeling wanted in the group. That's how the sheep begin to feel that they're refreshed in their soul. Uh, that's a real family that I'm building. So a good shepherd, number one, feeds. Number two, refreshes. Role number three of a good shepherd, guides. Guides. Psalm 23, verse 3, the second part says, He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Now, the members of your discipleship group, they have a tendency to stray. Can I just say it that way? We all, (laughs) Isaiah puts it even better than I could. He says in Isaiah 53, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Every one of us has gone their own separate way. That's, that's the, the human tendency. <laughs> the human tendency. We stray. Isaiah 53, 6. We stray. He says, we all like sheep. You notice he didn't say like any other animal. He didn't say like donkeys. <laughs> like sheep. Sheep are particularly notorious when it comes to straying. They always seem to think the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. And so they're always trying to dig out, even of a good pasture to find out a weak spot so they can go and eat what they think is better grass. And what happens is they easily lose focus and they get lost. They, they just disappear. They fall down a hole or they get eaten by prey. Away from the rest of the shepherd, the rest of the flock, they become vulnerable. And our people are just like that. Many of them have self-destructive patterns built into their own lives. They think the grass is greener, and I've seen this over the years at Mavuno Church. Somebody got saved, they fell in love with Jesus, they did Mizizi, they got into a life group, But because nobody was watching over them, they slowly went back into their old habits and patterns of living. And Friday nights became party nights again. And they went back into old friendships. And one day we woke up to realize the sheep was no longer in the pen. The sheep was a lost sheep. Am I talking to somebody who knows what I'm talking about? Yeah, this happens many, many times when there's no shepherd looking after them. They become vulnerable to all manner of predators. And as a shepherd, your role is to guide your disciples so they make godly choices. I know you might be the youngest person in the group and yet somehow they allowed you to be the shepherd. But because of that, there is a space for you to actually ensure you're praying for them and asking them about the decisions they're making. It's not about being a moral policeman, but it's about being a protective shepherd. When you see somebody or when you hear somebody speaking rudely to their spouse and cutting them off in a meeting, it's your job as a good shepherd to maybe cut them after the meeting gently and to say, by the way, I suspect you probably were not even conscious when you did it. But did you realize you, were really, you really spoke rudely? Or at least to the rest of us, it really sounded harsh how you spoke to your spouse. And I don't know, maybe it was just a moment of anger, or maybe it was an unprotected moment. But I want you to pray about that because it may be just that God is showing you there's something here that you need to deal with in your attitude to your spouse. Gosh, can you imagine saying that to somebody? That's what a shepherd does. That's what a shepherd does. You look after your people. You look after your people. Somebody shares about a business deal that they've received, and as they're sharing about it, you're thinking, I, that deal sounds too good to be true. What do they do to get that deal? I know they're planning to pay free the future from it, but something sounds a bit shady. And it's your job to go afterwards and say, by the way, tell me about that deal. I'm really curious. And to be able to say, that's not God's will. I don't think God will be honored by that deal. That's your job as a shepherd. Many times as shepherds we feel shy or we just kind of want to just run a meeting and it's done. But God is saying, no, 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 no. A good shepherd, he guides in paths of righteousness. He guides guides in paths of righteousness. Um, When you see a person who bullies others in the group, who dominates conversation, maybe it's you to have a gentle conversation later and say, "Um, you know, sometimes you talk, I love you, I love your contributions. I love that you always say something amazing in the group. And it's always so deep. But could you help me? Because I really feel like there's some people who are not sharing. I need you and I 
to prompt others to share. And maybe when you and I share too much, others don't get a chance. See what I just did just there? I've drawn the person to become a shepherd with me and help others. It's, it's saying, it's my job to make sure that the sheep are being guided. So I, I think, you know, when Kara and I are bringing up our children, we're always watching, isn't it? We're always like that behavior, that, the way that person spoke to their siblings, that was not good. We need to have a conversation. I mean, we're always watching because we're thinking, these people are going to go out there and leave their own families. And one day they're going to do that to their spouse. And so if we don't catch it now, it's going to hurt them. Parents do this all the time. But this is what God is asking you to do as a good shepherd, to guide your people in paths of righteousness. Who am I to judge other people and have issues of my own? Anybody thinking that? Maybe I'm asking you about your issues, but me, I know me, I have issues. Uh, how dare I speak to others? But listen, guys, we're all walking this journey. None of us is doing this because we are perfect. David was a man after God's own heart who slept with his friend's wife and then killed the friend. He had issues. And when I say friend, it wasn't just a soldier. Uriah was one of the, the mighty men. The guys who had died with him, died for him. And then he does that to him. The guy had issues. He was a messed up guy. But you know what? He was a Christian on the journey of transformation. He was a follower of God on the journey of transformation. And that's what God is calling us to be. Not perfect, but to be people who when we, when we are confronted about our own sin, we're like, create in me a clean heart, God. I'm sorry, God. I, I, I get it. I'm a sinner. Let me, you know, when we own it and we're like, let me grow. Oh, I'm growing as well. I'm struggling with the same thing, guys. Uh, it's not that I'm perfect, but because I'm your shepherd, I want to ask you that you will grow as well. So this is your job. It's to guide God's people. So every good sh shepherd, number one, what do you do? Feed. Number two, refresh. Number three, you guide the sheep. Number four, comforts. Comforts. Psalm 23 verse 4, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Comfort, uh, it, it, it insinuates easing or alleviating people who are in grief or who are dis in distress. As a shepherd, you're not just there for the good times. You're also there for the hard times. Things are difficult many times for your sheep. Sheep face attacks or sickness or injury. As a shepherd, you must ensure that your group members are walking together with each other. No one is ever left behind in a difficult time. The shepherd in Palestine had two tools. He had a rod and he had a staff. The, the, the rod was a straight piece of wood. It was like, almost like a club, but a thinner uh, piece, but, but heavy. And the idea of the club, it was a, a symbol of authority. It's what the, the shepherd would use to, to protect the sheep but also to keep the sheep in line, to, to actually discipline them when the sheep were being errant and straying. And so as a shepherd, you have, to use, you have to understand you have authority. You have authority. Yes, you may be a sheep in another pasture, but in this pasture, you're the shepherd. And God has given you the staff to comfort your people with authority. Whenever you go to, I always tell our discipleship group leaders when I'm training them, whenever you go to a funeral meeting or a, or a, a grief meeting and people are mourning and you go with your life, your discipleship group, you need to speak with authority. You need to say, on behalf of Pastor Angie and the entire Mavuno leadership, I'm here to offer condolences as a leader of this group to this family. S speak with authority. By the way, when people have done that, I show up in a meeting like that as a senior pastor, people, don't even, people tell me Mavuno has already been here. Yeah, I, they don't need me to come when the shepherd has done their job. In fact, they, 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 they actually just give me reports. Your people are amazing. Oh my gosh, we felt so looked after. And I'm like, yeah, it was Pastor Princeton. I'm like, who's that? Like, I've never met him, but he's a pastor. And he said, on behalf of the Mavuno, I'm here. I'm like, yes, that person understands their road. They understand that when I come into a place and people are grieving, I speak with authority. I represent God's people. Uh, so you need to understand you have authority. You actually have authority. But number two, was the staff. The staff was a, a, a slimmer piece. A, a, it's the one we normally see when, when, we show, when we see that picture of a blonde Jesus. Have you ever seen the blonde Jesus? Which is a very inaccurate picture of who Jesus looked like. But the thing about it, he always has that crooked, you know, like a thing that has a crook. And then it's a nice, really nice uh, looking. And, and the idea of a staff, a staff is a symbol of comfort. It was actually uh, used uh, many times when a sheep was, was um, going astray, the shepherd could actually use it and just pull it. Pull it back. When, when a ship had a, uh, when the EU had, the EU had um, a lamb, and the lamb was separated from the, from the, the U. 
E W E. You. Ewe. <laughs> hey, I've got work to do in this church. <laughs> Biology, English. Oy. So, so he would take the rod, the, the, sorry, the staff, and ho- take the lamb. With the, with, it's a very gentle, uh, in a gentle way, and take it back to its mom, the ewe. And why would he do that? Because if he holds it with the hands, the ewe might reject this lamb because it smells, it doesn't smell like it anymore. So it's a comforting, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tool to comfort. When a sheep was very shy and timid, a, a shepherd could, because it was long, pull it gently to examine it and to explore whether it, it was ill. So it's, it's actually a tool, for. it's different from this authority, it's a tool of comfort. And as a, as a discipleship group leader, you need to understand that you also bring care and comfort to people. It's your role to make sure that people are not walking alone in the group. You can do everything. By the way, whenever you feel yourself overwhelmed, you don't have to be the end all and be all. If somebody's struggling in their marriage and maybe you're single as a leader of the group, but they're marriage counselors, you can help refer them to the pastors of the church. You can help refer. But your job is to make sure that they don't die under your watch. That you're actually insisting, guys, you need help. I need you. Can I, can I connect you with Pastor Kilonzi? You need to just have a conversation about this. Uh, that's your job, to care to comfort God's people. So a good shepherd, what does he do or she do? Feed, refreshes, guides, comforts the sheep. The fifth role of a good shepherd is protects. Protects. Psalm 23 verse 5, it says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. You, in the presence of my enemies. We need to understand, a good shepherd always understands that you do your work in the context of opposition. There are always predators out there, wolves and lions and bears and all other kinds of animals that are salivating at the thought of turning one of your sheep into breakfast. This is your job. As a, you, you just need to be realistic when you're doing this job. You need to understand that the sheep that are most isolated are the ones that mo- uh, will most likely be eaten. And so your job is to make sure that your sheep are not, are, are not wandering off. King David talked about lions and bears that came to attack his sheep. And he had to put himself out on behalf of the sheep to protect them, even risking his life. Jesus said a good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The reality of our lives is that we live them out in the presence of our enemy. There are wolves waiting to devour your disciples. The wolves are there. It might be bad relationships. It might be uh, work, landmines at work. It, not, it might be just old habits and addictions. It might be all kinds of manner of things that the enemy has in store for them. And your job as a good shepherd is to protect them. How do you do this? Number one, prayer. Your prayer cover for your group. Let me just tell you guys, I love Mavuno Church and I pray for this church. I pray for you guys. But you're too many for, you to, for me to pray by name. Sorry. The names I mention every week, every week, every day before the Lord. There's some names that never miss to be mentioned. I always pray for Pastor Milton by name and Pastor Vivian every week. For Pastor Ndachi and Pastor Yvette every week. For Pastor Kevin and Pastor Faith every single week. For Pastor James. Like you guys, I pray for you. Like if I don't pray for you, I'm failing. Just know that if nobody else in the world is praying for you, I pray for you. Yeah, these are my disciples, Pastor Godi and Pastor Noah. I pray for them, Pastor Angie and Pastor Nick. These are my disciples, Pastor Sheila and Pastor Albu. Every week, every day, this, I, every day I try to pray for one of them at depth, and every week I pray for all of them. Because they're my sheep. I pray for their faith, I pray for their children, I pray for their marriages. If I know one of my sheep is troubled, I pray even deeper. By the way, don't imagine that your pastors have no issues. Hey, these sheep, they also stray. <laughs> they also have issues. So I, I, <laughs> so I pray for them, and I'm diligent in that prayer. I'm like, Lord, if I ever fail in anything else, I will never fail to pray for these guys. The other people I pray for, of course, my, my, my other sheep that God has given me in my house is my children. Uh, you know, my three children, I pray for them by name every week. And I go in details with their issues, their boyfriend, girlfriend issues, their class issues, their subjects, their exams. I pray. I cover them. And of course, my wife. 
I pray for her. Like, guys, if I pray for nobody else in the world, those ones are covered. Those ones are covered, and they know they're covered. And it's because I know the devil is looking to devour them. Is looking to devour them. Are your sheep covered? Would you be able to say, my goodness, my sheep, by the way, there's such a protection around them, the enemy cannot touch them. Like, I'm prayed up. I'm prayed up for my sheep. This is what God wants us to do. I'm concerned for them. I notice, by the way, if one of them is missing. Um, when we have family night every Wednesday, like I'm so excited to see, oh, one boy and Simon, Persis. I'm so excited. I'm always celebrating. But guys, can I be honest? The names I'm looking for. Did Pastor Milton check in? Hmm. Okay, Pastor Mills, we need to have a conversation. What's happening? I've not seen you in family night the last two weeks. Like, like I want to make sure he's there. Like, he's growing, he's connecting. Because if he's not, it's telling me something. There's something missing. So what I'm saying is, as a good shepherd, you protect your sheep. You pray for them. You, and when one is missing, you leave the 99 who are safe. That's what God teaches us. You go out of your way to look for that one that is lost and carry it back home with your staff. As good shepherds, we need to keep them close and sure, and sure none is left behind. John 10, 11 says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays his down for his sheep. And that's what God wants us to do. And so, a good shepherd. Let's go again. What does, it, what, what, what does a good shepherd do? Feeds, refreshes, guides, comforts, protects, protects the sheep. The sixth role of a good shepherd, and this is the last one I'll talk about in this passage, is a good shepherd releases. Releases. Psalm 23, verse 5, the second part. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. You know, back in biblical Palestine, sheep would smear oil and anoint the head of the, the sheep with oil, like completely. And the reason was to protect it from lice and all manner of insects. Some of those insects are so dangerous that unprotected, they would attack the sheep and even enter up the nostrils and the eyes. And some of them can even kill. Uh, they'll kill the sheep. They'll lay eggs inside the, those orifices and kill the sheep. And so the shepherd would put this oil all over that would make it very hard for any insect to come near one of his sheep. He anointed their head with oil. But you know, also anointing, so, so anointing in a sense has to do with protection, but also the word anointing referred to a person being poured on oil. David kind of mixes these metaphors. Uh, in a, in, 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 usually in a sacred ceremony. Uh, the oil was poured over them to bestow office, to bestow blessing upon them. And you see this happening all the time. Whether somebody was a king, anointing oil was poured over them. A prophet, they were anointed into their office. A priest, anointed into office. It was a transfer of blessing and authority from one leader to another. As a shepherd leader, your role is to transfer blessing and authority to your disciples. It's one of the ways that you protect them from being just stagnated in their growth is you anoint them and you expect them to grow. You put them into office. I love Jesus. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, and I say this, I mean, I love this verse, John 14, 12. It says, <laughs> and you very, in fact, he says, very truly I tell you. It's like Jesus is talking. And then Jesus says, by the way, this is the truth. It's like, Jesus, we don't quite expect you to lie the other times you talk. But it's like, but this one, like very, <laughs> it's King James says, verily, I tell thee. Like it carries weight, isn't it? It's like, this is very true. He says, the things, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing. They will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. It's like Jesus was so crazy. He expected the, the amazing things he had done. He was like, all of you guys, you're going to do more than this. And I'm sure they'll look at him like, hmm, I've just seen you raise Lazarus from the dead. I'm not so sure about this. It's like it's crazy. Like you expect me to raise people from the dead, Jesus? You expect me to feed 5,000 people or more? You Jesus is like, the things you've seen me do, I was actually doing them verily so that you can learn how to do them and do them better. You know, a good sh shepherd always calls out greatness in their sheep because we've said that in the Christian world, every sheep is supposed to be a shepherd. You're growing them to be their own shepherds. And so we have those, what I call, I see in you conversations. I see in you conversations is when I come to Pastor James and I say, by the way, I see in you a, an incredible shepherding gift that is greater than anything I've ever seen in this church. And I can't believe what God is going to do as you extend that gift 
and use it for the sake of this, this ministry. You're going to do far greater things. By the way, I'm not even modeling. I'm actually telling you, Pastor James. You're going to do far greater things than anything I ever did because you have that. Yeah. And because you have the platform, you know, because you're standing on my shoulders, you will do far greater things than anything I could even imagine doing. It's just the truth. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's true for anybody who follows me. I mean, it's like, you, you, if, you're, if you're not greater than me, Pastor Angie, I failed in my job. It's the same with your kids, isn't it? If Zola is not greater than you, then you failed as a parent. Because your job is to ensure they do greater things than you. And so as a discipleship group leader, my job is to call out greatness. I have shy people in my group. I have people who don't like being in front of people. I have people who think they can never shepherd anyone. I have people who think that sin, their sin is so unique that God is struggling to forgive them. I have people who have all manner of mixed up people in my group. And my job is to make sure that for every single one of them, they begin to understand, if God can use me, he can use you. And in fact, because I'm here, you will do greater things than me. Surely all my prayers for you are not for nothing. Uh, you will have to do greater things. I, I, I have an expectation. I'm calling out greatness in every single one of you. There's a great movie Cara and I were watching recently. Uh, actually, last night. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're, we, this is what we do to relax once in a while. Uh, it's called King Richard. And um, any one of you watch that movie? It's a movie. It's, it's worth watching. It's a story of um, the father of uh, Serena and Venus. Have you watched it, Pasi? Oh, my gosh. Like, this guy, he's so insane. He drew an 18-page plan for his kids, for his two daughters. Then he told his wife, this is the plan. Let's have two daughters. <laughs> like, they were not conceived yet. <laughs> and then he just kept telling those girls, you were playing Wimbledon. Like, he would introduce them. He introduced them to Pete Sampras, to, to some of the greatest tennis names. And he, when they would say, oh my God, I, we're about to meet Pete Sampras. He says, don't worry. One of these days, they will be saying they met you. Like, these are 16 years. He's talking to them, actually 12 years old. He's, the things you're, you're like, what? The guy had such a big vision for his daughters that one day when Venus was being, inter one of her first interviews, when she's being interviewed, she, was talk she had never played a pro match. And they asked her, do you think you can beat Jennifer Capriati? Do you think you can beat? She said, yeah, of course I can. No, in fact, she said, of course I will. They said, you, you really seem to believe it. She said, no, I know. Like, her father had spoken it into her so much, she got to the place where she was like, but it's true. He, he, he spoke the word into her, and an impartation took place. Guys, that's my job. That's your job as a, as a disciple is to help your sheep begin to believe that they will do greater things. I mean, Peter was such a doubter. He's a guy who disowned Jesus in the heat of the moment. He was a guy who had foot in mouth disease. He always said the wrong thing at the wrong time. But Jesus told him, Peter, you are the one. I will build my church. The gates of hell themselves will not prevent. Peter must have been like, hey. <laughs> in fact, I'm sure he just passed him. Shree. <laughs> But can you imagine in Acts chapter 3, after the Spirit has come, Peter is able to say to that guy at the temple, he's never done this before, he's like, silver and gold are none. But such as I have, I give to you. He's like, such as I have. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Authority! Authority! He believes what Jesus has called out of him. That's my job with the people I lead, to cause them to see the greatness that God has already put in them. I'm not making it up. C.S. Lewis said that if you are able to see the greatness of God's image in the person sitting next to you, if you could just see it, you would be tempted to bow down and worship them. The Bible says that we are, you know, that, that, that angels are ministering spirits to us. It says that we are built in God's image. When people in the, in, in, in the Bible, they saw an angel, they would worship. They would be struck dumb when they saw an angel in its pure form. Guys, an angel is my PA. You want to worship my PA? Look at me first. Are you understanding what I'm saying? That God, because God's image is in me, there's a greatness in me that is spiritual, that is so big, that if you guys could see me in my resurrected form, you would all fall down and worship. And guess what? It's not because I'm Pastor M. It's true of even the child sitting next to you in that seat. If you could only understand what God's image means in them, you'd be shocked. And one thing the devil doesn't want us to know he doesn't want us to know the greatness of God's image in us. He doesn't. He wants to close our eyes so we treat each other like nothing. 
When you understand that, you begin to just pray for your disciples. Lord, open their eyes. There's greatness in them. These are people who can change the world. These are people who can... Who, I've got the next president of a country in my, my discipleship group. I've got the next Billy Graham in my discipleship group. I've got, I've, I've got powerful people in this group. Open their eyes, Lord, to see it. And sometimes it, it, it may take you praying, God, show me so I can see, so I can pray it. Because sometimes you only see the issues of the people in your group. But God wants you to begin to understand, my goodness, I, I bring out greatness in others. Uh, we must desire for the people under our watch to exceed us. And let me just say this, um, as a couple, I've always known, for Kara and I, we've always known that the blessings God gives us are not just for us, they're for our children as well. So every time God would bless us with something, we'd always call out those blessings in our children. We believed that it was for them, because God can't bless me for me. God blessed Abraham so that the nations would be blessed. The people who would come out of him would be blessed. So every time God blesses us, we always call out those blessings. And me, I don't know. Let me tell you, when you have teenagers, sometimes you don't see how they're going to exceed you. Because sometimes you just see all the messes. But I'm sure even me, I was like that for my parents as they prayed. I call it out by faith. And we call out those things in them. But you know one of the things God began to reveal to Kara and I? He began to reveal to us the blessings he gives us are not just for our children in the house. They are for everybody we lead. Anybody who is under the, any church that we are a pastor of has every blessing that has been given to my house. It's just the truth. That it's my job now to call out that blessing in all of you. And for you to understand that God gave us blessings because of my role as a shepherd, in the, le- the, the shepherd that I lead in this sheep, the, uh, the, in this church, the blessings he gives me are for everybody that God has called me to lead. Everybody under my leadership. And so one of the things we've said is that we're go- <laughs> this year, <laughs> there are certain blessings God has given in this house. He has given that everybody, by the way, by the, before I call those blessings on you, God has showed them about me. He told me next year, your faith and your love for me is going to grow exponentially. I said, Jesus, thank you. Then I remembered, this is for my sheep as well. He said, you're going to love Mavuno like you never have. By the way, 2020, I admitted to some of you guys, I almost quit. I got to a place where I, I was jaded, even in follow, not in following Jesus, but I just felt I'm tired, I'm growing older. When, it's, when is it time to build my house? <laughs> like the guys in Haggai. And God told me, you're going to love Mavuno, you're going to love ministry, you're going to love the kingdom of God like you never have before. And you will love my people like you never have. I said, thank you, Jesus. And then I said, that's the blessing of Mavuno Church. And then God told me, you will be fruitful. You're going to actually see growth in every, you're going to bring people to the kingdom. I said, that's a blessing of Mavuno Church. By the way, those are your blessings, guys. Yeah, they're yours. And then he told me, there will be no smell of debt in your house. I say, God, I believe. I'm calling it out of my people as well. By the way, do you believe this year you're going to be out of debt? Yeah. You've got a shepherd in the valley. You shall not want. Why should you be in debt and you're his child? It's his blessing to us. So I think what I want you to understand is it's your job to call those blessings out in the people you lead. Yeah, when you're leading your group, they should not want. So you need to be able to ask guys, who's in debt in this group? Who's facing insurmountable debts? Let's start trusting God by faith for this person. Let's start allowing them, because they could, they could miss out because of unbelief. They could miss out because they don't believe God can do it. Let's start to call out the impossible for them as a group and help them to understand. Who's jaded in their faith? Who's feeling like they're in a dry uh, wilderness? Let's start believing for them as a group. I want to start trusting that, God, that their faith will even exceed the rest of us. And I want to actually make that an expectation before God. God, you said that for this house, so it's true for my DG, and it's true for this person. And I want that person to understand that you believe that for them. That's what it means for you to be a shepherd over God's people. Now this, by the way, let me just say, these things I'm teaching you, they apply in your discipleship group. They apply for those of you who are parents with your children. This is what good shepherds do. The disciples you have is your children. You cannot disciple in God's house if you are not discipling in your home as well. And so you, these are just tips on how you can start to pray and shepherd and protect your children. Some of them come naturally, others we have to learn from God's word. Now last year, we've declared this word for this house. 1 Corinthians 2.9, that's the word God gave me. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared. Come on, you have to say it like you believe it. What God has prepared for those who love him and I'm one of them. Yeah, you're one of them. This is your word. This is your word. It's the anointing of this house. Pray it into your life. Pray it into the lives of those you lead.
So these are the, good, the responsibilities of a good shepherd. I want to conclude this session. The responsibilities of a good shepherd. And what are they? Say it with me again. A good shepherd feeds. Number two, refreshes. Number three, guides. Number four, comforts. Number five, protects. Number six, and releases their sheep. Ask your neighbor, are you a good shepherd? <laughs> Ask your other neighbor, do you plan to be a good shepherd? Because <laughs> maybe they're not a good shepherd yet. <laughs> Yeah. So I want us to just uh, conclude in prayer. But let me just say, here's what happens when you start to be a good shepherd. Ah, and I really believe this for you guys. My God, I believe this. Goodness and mercy and love shall follow you, Mavuno people. It will follow you. I may not always have been a good shepherd, but I believe by God's grace, I will be a good shepherd. And this executive pastors, they will be good shepherds. And your campus pastors, they will be good shepherds. And because we will shepherd you well, goodness and love will follow you. They will follow you all the days of your life. And you will dwell in God's house, not next year, <laughs> but forever, forever. That is your blessing. That's what good shepherds do. They open blessings for their children, for their disciples. I want to just pray right now. And the people I want to pray for, just as we enter into a time of prayer, I want to pray first of all for reluctant shepherds. Reluctant shepherds. Reluctant shepherds are those people who maybe you're struggling right now. For some reason, you've just not seen yourself as a leader. Ah, you've been a backbench Christian. You prefer to be a sheep. <laughs> and it's just one of those things right now where you've struggled with the thought of you being a leader in God's house, leading other people. And because of that, you've withheld. You sort of sat back. And listen, I'm saying every single one of us, this is our destiny. Every single one of us, God is calling us to build God's house. We're going to serve. We're all going to be disciples. We're going to lead discipleship groups, every one of us. And so right now, maybe there's some people right now, you're struggling with that thought. It's just been such a difficult thought for you. I, I'm struggling with this whole culture change. I'm, I'm a reluctant shepherd. And I want to pray for you if this is you, because I believe that God's grace is here to pour anointing over you to release an impartation over you, to actually give you the strength and the ability to do the thing that you fear the most. And then maybe there are some people here who are already shepherds. You're leading your group right now, but you feel overwhelmed. You feel overwhelmed by them and by that role. But you know what? I believe the good shepherd is here to lift you up. Uh, the ultimate shepherd who's going to help you become the shepherd under his, his leadership. So I want to just pray for those people. And I'm going to be just be praying for you in a second right now. But as I do that, I just want to, I don't know why, I just feel, it's a very unusual thought, but I just sense that maybe there's some reluctant sheep. <laughs> maybe there's some people here who have not given your life to Jesus. You're not following the good shepherd yet. You've struggled about being a real, I mean, about following, I don't even know why you're here today. Maybe you just came because you felt compelled. You came with somebody but you've never given your life to Jesus. Or maybe you did a long time ago and you fell off. And right now you know you're not following Jesus. But something has strangely drawn you here. And I'll tell you what that is. He's called the Holy Spirit of God. He's the reason why you're here today. And I believe that he brought you here so you can understand that you're part of a family. And that God has a role for you. That your purpose is much bigger than anything you ever imagined. And the purpose giver is here to give that back to you. To restore you back into his house. And so I'd like to pray for anybody who's in that situation. Uh, you're at that place where you're like, Pastor, pray for me. I would love to give my life to Jesus. Uh, maybe I never understood why, but today for some reason it's become really clear why I need to do this. And so I'm, I'm going to ask you, again, like I said, this is an unusual thing to do in a leaders meeting like this. But if you're here, just raise your hand and then put it down again. I'd love to pray for you. Uh, this is not about other people. It's not about who you came with. Don't even worry about them. This is not about their destiny. Their destiny and their purpose, that's their business. But this is about you and who you are and who God created you to be. <laughs> this is about the thing that the devil has tried to steal from you, but God is restoring you back to his family. Whatever it is that caused you to fall off, to walk away from your father, your father is calling you back and he's saying, this is a day of salvation. And so if you're here, just raise it up. Don't be shy. Don't worry about your neighbors. Uh, just put it up. Be man enough to just put it up and put it down again. And I want to just pray for you and trust God for your salvation. Anybody who's here, just put it up and put it down again. I don't know why I just really have this compulsion. And I believe that the way the Holy Spirit works is He's speaking to somebody already. And He's just calling me to confirm that it is God speaking to you. So just put it up and put it down again. Anybody who's here, I would love to pray for you. I'm really patient with this one because somebody was patient with me once. I see a hand. Thank you, my sister. Come on, let's just appreciate that sister whose hand went up. Praise God. 
I told you, the, the Holy Spirit always, he's always, whenever I hear that prompting, I know he's talking to somebody already. I see, I see a brother at the back as well. To God be the glory. Wow. To, to God be the glory. I see a sister there. Oh, come on, Mavuno. We can do better than that. We bless God. We bless God. We bless God. Anybody who wants to join these ones, anybody who's just saying, pray for me, pastor. I would love to give my life to Christ. If you're in the watch parties, just let your pastor who's with you know. But maybe for those of you who are here physically, I'm your pastor here physically, just raise it up and put it down again. I would just love to pray for you. I just thank God. I mean, that is such an exciting thing. Thank you, my brother. I see you as well. To God be the glory. Woo! Yes. The loving heart of the Father. He's calling his sons and daughters back. That's what he's doing. He's quickening our hearts to love him, to come back to the one who made us, to show us the reason he made us. The enemy came to steal, kill and destroy, but God is saying, no, I came to give you life. The life you've always wanted. This is why we're created. So anybody else? I, I've seen a few hands already, but I don't want to miss anybody who's here who's just saying, Pastor, pray for me. Anybody else? Just join those who've raised their hands. I see a hand at the back. Praise God for you as well. To God be the glory. Wow, wow, wow. Oh, come on, Mavuna. Let's appreciate those who have started. Who've, who've done that. Bless God for you. Bless God for you. I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer for those who've raised their hands. And I'm going to ask, um, I'd just love to send our pastors, our executive pastors to stand with those people. Is that okay, guys? I just think it's such a powerful thing uh, that you have a pastor pray with you as you make that decision. So, Pastor Godwin, uh, there's a gentleman over there, second row, uh, white shirt, if you could go. Pastor Kevin, there's a lady uh, right at the back there. Pastor Milton, there's a, somebody at the back. Yeah? Just point them to whoever it is. Uh, Pastor Ndachi, there's somebody over there as well. Just The guys will show you. Just follow those hands. They'll show you where the hands are. Uh, just If you could just uh, yeah, stand with those people as they make that decision. The, the job of the pastor is just to agree with everything I'm praying. And the rest of us are going to be praying with you as you make this decision. Just stand with the pastor wherever you are. Just stand with them. And we're just going to pray with you right now. Father, thank you. Thank you for these, your servants. Oh, wow. Your sons, your daughters coming back home to the good shepherd we bless you lord you do you do things so well you actually brought these people here not because not because they even knew why perhaps they just came to see what was happening but you had a plan for them and it's an, a powerful plan and in this place lord you wanted something to happen eternally significant and we just thank you lord that you're calling sons and daughters back home and Lord, right now, even as they pray this prayer, we pray that, Lord, you would just, we know that heaven's gates are open and you're welcoming them. You're welcoming them back into your hands. And so I'm going to ask you to just say this prayer after me for those of you who are standing. And for the rest of us, if you've prayed this prayer, and I believe almost everybody here has, I want you to join them in saying these words together. Let's just accompany them as they come back home. Dear Jesus, I give you my life. Forgive my sins. I'm coming back home. From this day forward, I am your child. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I will no longer direct my life. I surrender to you. Help me to become everything that you created me to be. I am saved. In Jesus' name. Amen. Woo! Woo! Bless God for every single one of you. Hey, I'm going to ask you to just, uh, if, if the pastors have a slip of paper, if the ashes will give them that. If they don't, then just give them your phone number and tell them which campus you come from and we'll make sure that they call you this week and just connect with you. Uh, just call you and make sure that they give you some tips, some encouragement as you take this journey. So we bless God. God, we think we can appreciate them one more time. Wow. Wow. Isn't it exciting when people give their lives to Jesus in a family meeting? Oh, so good. So good. So good. I want to pray for reluctant shepherds. The rest of us. <laughs> Let me just ask us all to stand right now. This one I'm not going to differentiate. And maybe some of us, 
some of you have been in that place by the way where you've surrendered a hundred percent to Jesus you're leading right now as a shepherd you're like God everything of mine is yours I will be what you call me to do I'm leading your people this is your message you're like yes Lord and this prayer for you is just to affirm that is to say thank you Lord I'm affirmed in what I'm doing I will keep doing it there's some of you who are that place where you've been such reluctant shepherds you've sort of been back bench Christians some of you have been Christians a long time but you're still on the back bench some of you are Christians new Christians and because of that that's been kind of like an excuse for you but right now God is saying everyone builds my house everyone's a shepherd in this house and so I want to just put out your hands in a gesture of surrender and just say Lord I surrender I will follow you Father God, receive the surrender of your children. Receive the surrender of your children. As we surrender it all, as we give it up to you. Hey Lord, I'm praying that you are going to bring sheep to the shepherds. For each of these, Lord, you give them the heart of a shepherd. Father God, already begin to reorganize their thinking, reorganize their priorities that they start to think like you. I pray, show them the opportunities that they already have to shepherd your people. I pray that Lord Jesus, you'd show them. Some of them are not yet uh, discipleship group leaders in their churches. But I pray that Lord, after this, they will say, yes, count me in. I want to disciple people. I want to lead a group of people. I may not know how to do it, but with some training, I'm willing. Show me how to do it. And so I just pray over your shepherds, Lord, that Lord Jesus, you are a good shepherd. You are a good shepherd. And I declare that, Lord Jesus, you will show us how to be good shepherds. And I pray that, Lord, the people we lead in our homes, in our discipleship groups, that surely goodness and mercy will follow them all the days of their life. And they will dwell with you forever because of your shepherds. And so as we conclude, I want us to pray this prayer in Psalm 23, but I want us to change it a little bit. If the team could just put it there as part of our declaration as we conclude him at the back whenever you're ready the declaration anytime now Man. Are you ready? This is Psalm 23, but probably like you've never said it. Because the words that apply to the Lord apply to you now. You are a good shepherd. You are a good shepherd. Let's say these words together. I am a good shepherd. My disciples will lack nothing. I will feed them with God's word so that they lie down in green pastures. By creating a loving environment, I will lead them beside quiet waters. I will feed them with God's word so that they lie down in green pastures. I will lead them beside quiet waters. Let's go to verse 3. And refresh their souls. I will guide them along the right paths for the sake of God's name. Verse 4, even though they walk through the darkest valley, they will fear no evil, for I will ensure we walk with them, using the rod and staff of authority and care to comfort them. Verse 5, I will protect them, preparing a table before them in the presence of the enemy. I will anoint them by calling them out to do greater things than me so that they will overflow with blessing and authority. And verse 6 says, Surely God's goodness and love will follow them all the days of their lives, and they will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I just release upon you right now the impartation of a shepherd. I declare over you that God is giving you spiritual authority that you've never experienced before. It doesn't matter what your age is. It doesn't matter whether you're leading people older than you. The authority you will have is the authority of the disciples that made people marvel and recognize they had been with Jesus. And so I declare over you spiritual authority. I declare over you wisdom beyond anything you have known in the past. I declare over you a shepherd's heart. 
and I bless you God's people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and God's people say it together Amen, Amen. Woo! bless the Lord